Okay, let's get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy, beautiful Saturday. It's Saturday, right? Um, we are excited to start this event featuring the one, the only, the one, the only James Howard speaking about the history of the black industrial designer. My name is Ratish and I'm one of the volunteer folks with Where are the Black Designers and we'll help moderate some Q&A afterwards. Here's the agenda. James will speak for about 20 minutes. Afterwards, we'll ask some pre-prepared questions for about 30 minutes or so. And then lastly, we'll have the opportunity for you all to chime in with your own questions for the last 45 minutes or so. Um, as James is speaking, please drop any questions and whatnot into the chat, heart emojis, thumbs up, quotes, all that stuff, throw it into the chat. And if there are any particular questions, we'll be sure to get to them towards the end of the conversation. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass the mic over to James Howard. Welcome, James. Thank you, Ritesh. And welcome everyone in today's um, lesson and lecture on the history of Black industrial designers. I want to first, before I begin, thank Mitzi for her hard work and putting, helping to put this program together, Dr. Leslie and Noel, as well as Ratish. And welcome my viewing audience. I am James Howard. I am presently the Executive Director for the Black Inventors Hall of Fame. And I'm also founder and owner of Entrepreneurial U. Entrepreneurial U is built as Morris County, New Jersey's first and only school of design thinking. I'm also a lifelong academician and design historian. So it's with great pleasure and honor that I bring to you today the history of Black industrial designers. Turns out the history of the Black industrial designer reads just like a biblical parable. You see, it begins with the sea. Chapter one, the sea. Chapter two, the roots. And chapter three, the produce. Let's begin with the sea. You see, we have to go back more than 300 years and I introduce you to an African-American slave by the name of Onesimus. Turns out Onesimus opened up a cure for smallpox. In fact, smallpox is the only infectious disease that the WHO organization has ever certified as being completely eradicated off the face of the earth. And the answer came from an African-American slave innovator named Onesimus. Now you have to understand, Onesimus is a biblical name, which means the useful one, except Onesimus slave owner truly saw no use in him. In fact, he had a basic fundamental belief that all slaves were useless. And as such, he did not trust anything that came out of Onesimus' mouth or any other slave's mouth. But Onesimus was persistent when trying to convince and explain to his master that he had an answer for curing smallpox. So persistent was it that it indicated that he had one of the first qualities necessary for any industrial designer to succeed, and that is empathy. He demonstrated empathy even in the face of having it for those who would deny him his freedom. And so he was persistent and letting his master know, I have an answer. And so persistent was it that on one fateful day, the town doctor's son happened to come down with smallpox. And Onesimus' master at that time shared with the town doctor what he had learned from Onesimus. And the town doctor said, let me speak to this man. He sounds like he may have something. And sure enough, Onesimus not only spoke, but he demonstrated exactly how to cure this problem. The doctor adopted that procedure and ran it throughout the entire town and infections started declining and declining and declining. The next thing you know, we had set a pathway towards inoculation and full eradication. Credit Onesimus. 
Now that's chapter one. That's the seed. What we got out of that seed was belief and conviction and what you know and empathy, two qualities that make up an industrial designer. So we now fast forward 172 years and we introduce you to Elijah McCoy, the original Elijah McCoy, the real McCoy. And Elijah McCoy, it turns out, was a Canadian born African who had developed a lubricating can that helped to revolutionize the locomotive industry. Revolutionized the locomotive industry. He was one of the more prolific African American and Canadian born American um, inventors in the history. He had over 57 patents. And his most noted patent was a lubricating can that helped to facilitate the lubrication of parts when trains would have to go into the depot to be fully lubricated before they continue on. And this lubricating can was so successful that it was soon knocked off. You see, it was originally Elijah McCoy's idea to patent it and then sell it. Patent it and then sell it. But in every attempt that he made to sell it, he was met with a no. And not only was he met with a no, oftentimes the manufacturers would just knock it off and steal it. But the daycare, he's a black man. So this went on for many years. And Elijah McCoy kept knocking on doors, trying to get his product on the market. And everyone kept saying no. And suddenly he started realizing that his product was on the market anyway by way of others. And so he was determined to break through. And what did he decide to do? He decided to manufacture his own lubricating can, setting up one of the country's first Af um, African, Canadian born, American uh, manufacturing companies. Bottom line, he introduced manufacturing to our community. And his product soon started making it across the country, side by side with other knockoffs. People would soon start going into the stores and deciding to purchase the lubricating can. And oftentimes, they would look at the store owner and say, hey, is this the real McCoy? That is just how well designed his product was. And that is where the expression the real McCoy comes from. Elijah McCoy. Now, what did he demonstrate? He demonstrated, one, a passion to believe that he could get his product out there, and rightfully so. And he also demonstrated an entrepreneurial quality. And both of these qualities, I believe, were key to any successful journey through the industrial design profession. He was the root, chapter two. Elijah McCoy, the root. Then we advance to chapter three, the produce. And in chapter three, we get introduced to two gentlemen that pretty much represents the entire product of that rooted effort that Elijah McCoy had established and that empathetic passion that Onesimus had planted the seed for. And these two gentlemen, are named McKinley Thompson and Charlie Harrison, respectfully. We'll begin with McKinley Thompson. You see, McKinley Thompson, it turns out, was the country's first African-American car designers. Yes, I said the first African-American car designer. And in 1956, when he was offered to come and work for Ford, McKinley Thompson was living out a dream and a passion that had fueled him since he was 13 years old. Now, I understand we have a 14-year-old in the office. I want you to pay close attention to this story. You see, it turns out when he first laid eyes on the sun beaming over a 1939 DeSoto car, it resonated so much with his DNA that he had said right there in that moment, he realized his aha moment, as Oprah would call it, and he had determined right there in that moment that he would become an automotive designer. 
So one of the first things he did was entered into an important contest, which was titled From Dreams to Drawing Board, put on by Motor Trend Magazine, and he won. He won. He would then go on to receive a scholarship to the Art Center of California, and there was another first. He was the first African American to enter into that program, into that school. And then upon graduating from the Art Center, he then got introduced to the automotive industry and joined the ranks of Ford. And during his illustrious career, he worked on some of the most important cars in that entire line, including the 1964 convertible Thunderbird. Now, many of you are of the age where your parents would know that car. Okay, they would know that car for sure. It was a classic. It still is a classic. But you see, McKinley Thompson had more than just a desire to fulfill a dream as a car designer. He too was attached to empathy because his real pet project, the one that he actually took through his grave, was a project related to a concept car called the Warrior. And what was the Warrior? The Warrior was a car that addressed the unmet needs of third world countries with rough terrains and the inability for, uh, for scarce fuel capacity and so forth and so forth. So he developed a concept car that at that time was talking up to 50 miles per gallon of gasoline. And that was unheard of at the time. So he was President Seti. He was a first. He was a pioneer and he was a dreamer and he lived out his dream, but he attached to that dream a deeper mission, a mission that was somewhat philanthropic, empathetic to the needs of third world countries. McKinley Thompson, a great man. He would go on to be awarded in 1962 Ford's highest award for citizen of the year, inspired by the glow of the sun. Now, this next industrial designer is affectionately referred to as the Jackie Robinson of industrial design. And that label was attached to him by way of a colleague, an esteemed colleague that I happen to know personally, Nancy Perkins. And Nancy Perkins actually worked with this gentleman. This gentleman's name was Charlie Harrison. And I know we have someone in the audience that was looking uh, for me to bring up Charlie. Apparently, he's familiar with uh, Charlie's background. He plain and simply is the most prolific African-American industrial designers in history. He has designed over 700 products. He was Sears first black executive. We're not just talking about first black designer. He was Sears' first black executive. Okay? And in an illustrious career of over 31 years with Sears, he would go on to control and be the head of the department and watch over more than 700 products, household related products. And it turns out Charlie was also a breakthrough genius because what he did under his tutelage and under his watch, he embraced this newfound material, which is called plastics. It was just beginning to go somewhat worldwide and global plastics. And he took his knowledge of plastics. And he was always attempting to make things better, quicker, lighter weight, and easier to use. Now, why was the easier to use com uh, component necessary? Because it turns out Mr. Harrison was dyslexic. He was dyslexic. And yet he took that particular impairment and parlayed that into his passion for designing products, as he would say, can be assembled without any instructions. Okay? And after coming out of the Army, he took up art, went to design school and again begun his illustrious career with Sears. His most noted product 
is one in which has influenced a product that you and your generation uses today. And that is the virtual goggles. You see, Charlie did not invent the Viewmaster, but he made it a worldwide sensation. When his department was asked to redesign it, his design has stood the test of time and has made that a worldwide sensation and a product that has even continued to have influence, like I say, for today's virtual goggles, the Viewmaster. Another product that he designed was simply the plastic waistband. And you say to yourself, it's a waistband, so, how, so what? But the truth of the matter is, it was one of the, at the time, one of the largest products ever produced in plastic. So he proved the methodology, he proved the process, and he too made life easier. See, I grew up in Chicago. In fact, I was just checking the roster there to see if we had anyone in the room from Chicago. And I recall waking up to the clingy clang clangs of the metal garbage can as the, as the sanitation engineers, as we call them, would come and empty our garbage and occasionally just throw it back at the yard. And it would go bang, bang, clang, clang. And Charlie is noted for making a uh, comment about that was one of his impetus for designing the plastic waistband. So when you see garbage bins on the street today with the wheels, and the nice convenient handles, and you go to the Home Depots of the world and the Lowe's, and you see all these beautiful plastic waistbands, credit Charlie Harrison. The Jackie Robinson of industrial design. Now he was part of the golden age of industrial design. He and McKinley Thompson, they carried the torch for people of our time. Up until that point and moment in time, we really had no franchise in that space, none at all. And they opened up doors for us. How do I know this? Because I'm a byproduct of that door. Turns out, Mr. Harrison was my mentor. I met him personally, had lunch with him, and I wanna share with you what he shared with me. He says, it will come, young man, it will come. Be patient. And what he advised is that I stay the course, I stay the course, and that I strive for excellence. Stay the course, strive for excellence. And those words left an indelible impression on me, you see, because my life was full of a lot of no's in the same way Elijah McCoy was told, no, we're not going to buy your product. But I was told, no, we're not going to hire you. More than 14 times, no, no, no. And even prior to going on the interview circuit and being told, no, I was advised in my senior year by my senior instructor after I had come home from spring break that he had shown my work to some consultants that he brought in and it was the advice of the consultants that I consider changing careers. Now this is just four weeks prior to graduating and you're being told maybe you should consider changing careers. But yet I persevered. I moved on. So during that year of 1980, summer of 80, I'm knocking on these doors and I hear no 14 times. So what do I decide to do? I decide to go back to school. One week, maybe 10 days, 10 days before the start of grad school, I have the audacity to call up the chairperson of the industrial design graduate program, University of Illinois Chicago campus. At that time, it was actually still called Circle Campus and it was in its transition year from Circle Campus to at Chicago. But, a gentleman by the name of Cy Steiner. He was a very empathetic gentleman. And he looked at me and he looked at my portfolio. And he says, listen, James, I am not supposed to do this, but I'm gonna go ahead and let you in. It's against our rules, but he sensed something in me. He sensed the quality in me that perhaps McKinley Thompson had demonstrated when he first saw that sunbeam blow over and bathe over the 1939 DeSoto. 
he connected and he let me in, much to the chagrin of my advisor. You see, my advisor was a lifelong industrial designer and academician, had become somewhat uh, famous for his contributions to the airline industry and the design of airline controls and, and, and planes and all of that. In the 14th week of my first semester under his tutelage, I was met with these favorite words. Get out of the profession. I don't know why they let you into the program. In fact, compared to the other graduate students, you rank a zero. Yes, you rank a zero. I refer to that as my Hugo Macaulay moment. And what am I supposed to do with those words, but persevere? And then the famous words of someone that you would be familiar with, John Legend, the famous singer. John Legend says, if you hear no today, take it as no for now. No for now. And that's what I did. OK. You don't want to be my advisor? Move on. They assigned me another advisor. That particular advisor had made a suggestion to me to enter my graduate project into a competition, an international design competition. And just like McKinley Thompson had won his award, I won as well and helped to put that particular program on the map. So in moments like that, you have to adopt the posture of what Anna Marie Chavez, the president of the Girl Scouts of America, you have to adopt the posture of one of her advice to collegiate students. And that is, don't let anyone, don't let anyone change your trajectory. Like McKinley Thompson, I was determined to be an industrial designer. And I was not gonna let the 14 no's, I was not gonna let the advice and suggestion of a consultant that perhaps I should change careers. And I certainly was not gonna let being equated with being a zero compared to the other graduate students change my trajectory. Some total 300, 400 plus products, 18 patents, serial entrepreneur, lifelong academician and design historian and just someone very passionate about sharing a message, a message that will help you, some aspiring designers, others just curious to be made better by a small smidgen of additional information, which more than likely you did not have. The history of black industrial design is an abbreviated one told essentially by those three chapters that I just mentioned. But see, there's another chapter. You know what that chapter is? That's you. You will be adding to that chapter. Some of you, if not you, some of your colleagues, you'll be adding to that chapter. And I want to be there to read it. So please keep in touch with me with each and every progress and each and every ounce of curiosity that you demonstrate moving forward forward, tap into me and let me know. And if Charlie was able to look down right now and remember that one time that we have it to meet over lunch, he will look down with pride and say, I'm glad James did not listen to the naysayers. And I'm glad that he sought his calling. So listen, everyone. Measure for measure, there is no greater pleasure than to bring this message to you about the history of the Black industrial designer. Thank you. James, I think I speak on behalf of everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing the mic drops. I'm seeing the hand claps. I'm seeing the thank yous. I'm seeing all that in the chat, um, feeling the exact same way. Um, 
Now let's let's kick it off with a, some questions. I think um, there is so much to dive into. And again, thank you for being here. So first off, let's start with some of the basics. Why do you prefer to be called James and not Jim? Can you talk oh. through a little bit about that? Because names are important, language is important, and I would love to understand your reasoning behind it. I really appreciate you bringing that to the fore because the answer is part and part of the reason why our story is abbreviated. And I have to take you back to my freshman year, 1976, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. In that particular year, there were six African-American freshmen who were enrolled into that program, the largest they had ever seen before, six of us. And the chairperson of that program would go on over the ensuing four years to refer to each one of us as Jim. And I was the only Jim in the bunch. So it didn't dawn on me until I was about to graduate. And I said, wait a minute, he is calling all of us Jim. Why is that? And that resonated with me and it stuck with me. And I was determined by graduation that no one would ever, ever, ever be allowed to call me Jim for that very reason. My colleagues, the other five brothers, they had their own identity. And it's important for us to be able to stand on that identity. And for one individual not to take the time to understand that. And I know it was of the time. We were just behind the civil rights movement and all the riots and so forth and so forth. But nonetheless, it just left that impression upon me that that was a name that I don't want to hear enough of. I heard it six times fold while in college. So that explains why. Thank you. That's super powerful. Um, now let's, let's talk about your project, Black Inventors Hall of Fame. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is and how some of the people in the audience could potentially help support it? Uh, thank you. Indeed. Indeed. Well, the Black Hall of Fame, uh, Black Inventors Hall of Fame, is a virtual museum developed so that the genius of Black innovation is immortalized. Now, bite on that word, immortalized, you see, because over the years, although I did an abbreviated chapter and introduced you only to four key subjects, there have been many other players. There have been tons and tons of innovative genius demonstrated on behalf of the African-American community. But much of that story has not been told. Much of that story has been buried. And it's the intentions of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame to uproot those stories and immortalize them. And it's a virtual museum. And we are, in fact, looking for anyone who is willing to contribute to our efforts. We opened it up in June. And at this point in time, we are uh, going to be engaging an innovation challenge. And the debate is whether or not we're going to focus perhaps on select schools, maybe all HBCUs, even though I'm beginning to get some pushback on that, or just to all schools. But it will be a challenge directed toward the African-American collegiate student, and it will have at its core serving an unmet, wicked social need. And we know what those needs are. We certainly know what those needs are. So if anyone is interested in supporting it and uh, playing a role, to volunteer, has any levels of expertise or suggestions on which schools would be perfect for us to pitch this challenge to, please, uh, at the end of this program, Ritish will be putting up all of my contact information and please reach out to me. Incredible. Somebody in the chat named Rachel uh, has mentioned Professor Kenneth Manning at MIT, I believe that's the pronunciation, um, has collected since the 1970s and work, uh, wrote a text on EE Just. Thank you, Rachel, for submitting that. Um, now, you had mentioned some pushback that you're getting. This seems like a, why would you get pushback? Uh, on the notion of the pushback would be just to be careful not to deny the potential of brothers and sisters who are at, at the traditional public schools as well that they are equally, equally talented. That's, that's primarily. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk about some of your patents. I'm assuming you have about a thousand of them. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about like some of your favorite ones and maybe also some advice that you might have for people looking to do the same? I think this idea of owning your own idea and your own product is very empowering. And yes. I would love to see more of that happen. And I think patents can be difficult to get. People don't know how to do it and it can, be, can seem complex, but mm -hmm. in actuality, maybe it's not. So talk a little bit about that. I would love that. Excellent. But it turns out I do have about 18 patents. I sort of stopped counting after I got to about 15, but I have about 18 or 19 patents. And essentially a patent is just that. It is the country, in fact, the world, although primarily it's, it's United States patents. It is the country recognizing you as the original producer of that idea. An idea that does not have to necessarily be played out in the embodiment of three-dimensionality. It can stay on paper, it does not have to be physically produced, but it has to be proven through abstracts and through illustrations that you are the originator of that idea. And when that is proven through a patent search and other due diligence, you are granted a patent, the same way Elijah McCoy was granted all of his 57 patents. So I want to take an opportunity to show you my very first patent. This happens to be a spoon called the Ableware Spoon. And it is designed for people with physical impairments, with limited range of motion, people who have difficulties doing what's called the on flexion, because it has a special angle to accommodate for that. It has a special raised wall right here for holding food up on the bowl of the spoon. And then it has a special chamfered edge here for cutting easily into potatoes and peas and things of that nature. And then lastly, its primary feature is a recess handle right here so that you can place on that a two-piece enlarged handle so that this audience can uh, grab the spoon with what's called a gross motor grip as opposed to a fine motor grip. This was my first, first patent issued in 1983, and I've since gone on to amass, like I said, about 18 more. My most prominent patent is one that I am proud of and it's saving lives every day as we speak. In fact, there are two I'll, I'll mention briefly to you. One is a neonatal pressure relief valve designed to resuscitate newborn infants at birth. So when a child is rushed out of the birth canal and suddenly the doctors and nurses have to administer oxygen to those delicate lungs, my valve is responsible for regulating the flow of oxygen to those delicate lungs. If you don't deliver enough oxygen, the results could be fatal. If you deliver too much oxygen, the results could be fatal. So the valve is designed to pop off any excess amount of oxygen so that the flow can continue and no excess oxygen is popped off without causing irreparable damage. Another patent I have is a cardiovascular delivery device that is responsible for unclogging clogged arteries in stat situations. So this particular uh, interventional device ramps up the pressure and through a catheter up through the femoral artery and tube system, flushes out your valve, your, uh, your artery, your clogged artery within microseconds. Why is that so important? Because in stat situations with a clogged artery in your heart, seconds count. And I'm very proud of that uh, product. Uh, designed for B-Brown Medical. So if any of you are interested in pursuing a patent, I have to consider myself somewhat of an expert in patents, so much so that I had the audacity to apply for one during the COVID crisis, okay? And I just received about 20 days ago from the U.S. Patent Office the letter that my patent has gone from provisional patent status to patent pending status. I'll keep you in curiosity as to exactly what the product is, but I will share with you this, uh, that it could be a game changer and it is related to keeping safe in this COVID environment. Okay, I have a lot of questions. First off, how do we get access to those spoon doikis? Can we buy them <laughs> in a pack of a thousand or something? A lot of people are really loving that. Yeah, I can. Uh, I'm still in touch with the manufacturer. 
I can have a host of them sent to me on call notice free of charge and I'll, and I'll get them to you and you can uh, distribute them accordingly. I could see those being very great for a market like maybe an older folks home or something like that where Indeed. there are mobility issues, which you've probably Indeed. thought about. Okay. Indeed. Um, now one question from, from Rachel uh, in the chat is, how have you gone about finding a patent lawyer that you trust? Lawyers trust. How do we, how do we make those work? Um, I'm just kidding for any of the lawyers out there, but seriously, how do you, how have you gone around uh, about this? And, and, you know, patenting can be expensive, not only to time, and, but can. in terms of monetarily. So what are your advice for people who don't have a lawyer of access to a lawyer? What would you say to them? Well, I have an advice you do is to trust what I'm about to tell you. And that is that there can be a low cost avenue and pathway towards getting a patent. And it is called LegalZoom. All right. My last couple of patents have gone through LegalZoom. And it has saved me thousands upon thousands of dollars. Now, if you just so happen to be working with one of those companies that have these commercials about sending your invention and will help you get it to market, stop that process right now because a lot of those companies really have ill intentions. All they want to do is to just feed you and have you, you know, feed them money and sort of have you chasing a carrot on a stick and your product gets nowhere. Uh, some of them have good intentions, but a lot of them really are just uh, garbage dumps for your funds, and you don't want to do that. I would much rather counsel you and give you all of my advice on how to get your product to the market than see you spend four or five thousand dollars with an inventions company. And I got to share this brief story with you. One of my patents happens to be a paper towel dispenser that I designed for Scott Paper Towel Company. This paper towel dispenser was one of the first dispensers that allowed automatic and segmented dispensing without the aid of a mechanical gear ratcheting. Fast forward 10 years later, my niece's husband, a brilliant guy, comes up with a great idea. He has this great idea. You know what his idea was? Exactly what I had gotten the patent on 15 years prior. And before I found out, he has spent over 5000 dollars of their savings with an inventions marketing company only to find out that there was no way they could have done anything with his product so be careful please send me all your concerns and i'll put you in touch if not if i'm not able to direct you accordingly i'll put you in touch with one of my many uh patent uh, friends and associates and uh, counsel that's in, and get it done for you Incredible, incredible. And there's probably a lot of more stuff to talk about patents. Uh, certain individuals have questions. We'll be sure to link your email address. I believe you had mentioned that you're okay with people emailing you. So we'll be sure to drop that later in this chat. So if any of you all want to chat more and we don't get around to a question, obviously we'll handle that way. Um, let's talk about a little bit about inspiration um, and kind of talk about that. So who, um, who currently is some of your like black industrial design influences? Um, and how do you stay inspired? How do I stay inspired? Well, I stay inspired by teaching the subject. And that uh, inspiration is the root of me starting my school. You can see behind me those two large yellow uh, letters in orange and blue. Uh, that's entrepreneurial you. So by being the constant messenger of the subject matter, you, it's difficult to get bored. It's difficult to get complacent because you're always holding yourself accountable. So who inspires me? The people who come through my program, these are long-term unemployed adults, many of them, who have been looking to shift their career pathways, who have gone three, four years without a job, and is sort of at a crossroads, just needing to get out of neutral. And Entrepreneurial shows them how to do that by applying design thinking, a unique methodology that I spend, um, you know, um, pretty much 24 seven um, administering and practicing and sharing. So that's my inspiration, but I'm gonna give you a specific individual and he's not a designer. He's actually not a designer, but as it turns out, this brother inspires me because of he has the one 
quality that is what I call the precursor quality to being a successful designer. And that quality is empathy. And this brother demonstrates it every single time he comes to the mic. And that is none other than the esteemed Dr. Cornell West. Okay? So if you haven't had a chance to just listen to this brother speak, take that opportunity. And you will sense, like I do, that he has such an empathetic quality, not just for his people of the African-American community, but for all mankind. And he wears it in his DNA, and he inspires me every time I hear him speak. So, yeah, that's one of my main uh, inspirations, Dr. Cornell West. Love it. Uh, Candace in the chat is loving empathy, driving your inspiration. That's amazing. Um, now, can you talk to me, or talk to us, rather, about your love of Stephen Burks at Man Made. Ah, yes. And I yes. feel like that is a, an individual that you have shouted out a few times in the past. And I would love, I think everyone would love to understand what you love about him and why and what we can learn about him. Sure. Well, this brother is present day. He's present day. I told you about McKinley Thompson. I told you about Charlie. I even told you about myself. But this particular brother is more of your peer and his name is Steven Burke. He is classically trained as an industrial designer, and he has an entrepreneurial spirit, in the same way Elijah McCoy has an entrepreneurial spirit, in the same way I have an entrepreneurial spirit. And he is out of New York, so many of you that gave out shouts to New York, he's near you. But let me tell you a little bit about this brother. One, he focuses on hand autographs, hand autograph furniture. His furniture and products and accessories have been demonstrated at the MoMA, at the Museum of Art and Design, and all throughout the world. He is considered a modern day visionary. And if you don't know this brother, read up on his story. His company is called Stephen Burke's Man Made. Stephen Burke's Man Made. And he recently received the National Design Award and Product Design from the Harvard Law fellowship. And so he inspires me. I could have easily have thrown his name in there right behind Dr. West, but he is a designer that in fact inspires me because he continues to move on and get past those perils. He's a visionary, he's an entrepreneur, and he too is empathetic. Why? Because many of the reasons why he focuses on handmade autograph, um, artifacts is because when it's being made by hand, it's not being powered by machine. And when it's being powered by machine, it is adding, it is adding to our carbon footprint. So this brother too has deep concerns for the environment and it's reflected in the beauty of his products. Love it. Thank you. I posted um, Stephen Burks's website in the chat. And what I love about it, not in, only is the design beautiful, I love the use of orange, um, yeah. but also towards the bottom of the homepage, there are a bunch of amazing articles, references, et cetera, for more reading and whatnot. Uh, fantastic. Um, now let's, let's talk about how do I approach this? Let's talk about young designers and could be industrial designers. Um, let's say there's a 16 year old black woman who has never heard of industrial design, never heard of the term design thinking, never in, heard about any of these terms and isn't even exploring it as a career option, doesn't even know that it's a career. What would you just say to her and her parents to convince her and them that it's a worthwhile pursuit? What I would encourage them to do is to discover their McKinley Thompson moment. We all have it. Oprah has spoken of it. It's that aha moment. It's a commitment to it. It is an awareness, a fullness and an awareness and a deep, ingrown, innate ability to connect to it. And once you connect to it, you go for it. I had it. For me, it was taken apart the old fashioned bell telephone. And I'm sure we have a few folks in the audience that remembers those old fashioned heavy weighted uh, bell telephones. 
And with me, it was taking it apart and just raising a question, how is that made? You know, how is that done? And it piqued my curiosity. You add that with a little bit of artistic sensibility and the next thing you know, you have an industrial designer. But when you attach to that, again, I want to revert you back to Anna Marie Chavez's advice. And once you attach to it, set that in your pathway set that in your pathway, adopt it as a dream, dream it, stay on that dream, and then believe that dream, and then further achieve that dream. We call it the DBA and the design uh, thinking community, doing business as a design thinker. Dream it, believe it, achieve it. So that would be the advice that I would give to the mom, and I know we have a 14-year-old in the audience, so those words are specifically for you. Dream it, believe it, achieve it. Thank you. Now, do you explain yourself to younger folk as an inventor? Do you explain yourself as an industrial designer? I'm, I'm wondering how do you brand and how does the industry need to brand itself in order to grow sure. and be more understandable, understandable by everyone? That is a great question. As you can imagine, I have been asked over my career what, what it is that I do, but I want to get to the root of the lecture, and that is industrial design. In my first 20 years as an industrial designer, every single time someone asked me what I did, I would have a different answer. But what was at the core of that was someone who had a deep, grown concern for humankind. Today, we call it human-centered design. And all industrial designers have to have that. So when I repackage and rebrand myself today, that's pretty much how I describe myself as someone who is passionate about helping humankind. This is why I opened up a school because design thinking is not the exclusive domain of the designer. Anyone can learn it. Anyone can be improved by it. So some of the sound bites that I use to describe myself today is, thought leader in design thinking. I really don't like using the word expert, so I say thought leader in design thinking, passionate, serial entrepreneur, inventor, lifelong academician. Believe it or not, yes, I have taught now for over 30 years. Lifelong entrepreneur, uh, academician, and just a passionate uh, individual who's willing to go the last mile to help anyone who wants to help themselves. Fantastic. Now, something that I really love about your work specifically is that the end result of some of the stuff that you've shown that everyone really loved in the chat is that you're making life a little bit more bearable. And you're also, and also taking to extreme saving lives in, in many of the inventions that you have. And I think that's an interesting thing a way for younger folk to think about stuff is that you could be create, you don't have to necessarily be a doctor. Um, you could be a, uh, an inventor, an industrial designer, and actually save lives, right? And I'm curious, does that resonate with you at all? Indeed, for sure, because when you follow the basic tenets of the design thinking process, and I see we have a, a sister in the audience who is absolutely quite expert in understanding this, Dr. Leslie Ann Noll. When you follow the basic tenets, all right, you are able to place your sensibility, your ability to be empathetic to a human-centered need and then direct that and be the lead player in helping to bring others, because nothing's done in the vacuum. I have designed well over 300, 400 products in my lifetime. I have over 18 patents, but many of those have been collaborative efforts, working with engineers, working with housewives, working with doctors, working with this, working with that. So when you adopt that collaborative spirit and you bring that into the messaging, you're able to pretty much uh, lead uh, and play the lead role in getting things done, getting things done. And that's pretty much what industrial designers have been charged to do uh, ever since the, uh, the turn of the 20th century. Okay, this is kind of a loaded question. Um, mm -hmm as I guess all of my questions have been so far and the, the questions from the community, right? But uh, to continue that spirit, what is the most efficient and effective path 
to getting a, a job in industrial design. We have some folks in the audience that might be thinking about switching to industrial design. Excellent. We have some folks who uh, are maybe straight out of college. Um, and this might be their first job. I'm really curious about that. And I'm sure there's a lot of discussion to be had beyond that afterwards. Sure. Well, my suggestion is to be fueled with passion. Really, be fueled with passion. Fall in love with curiosity. All right? If you want to play in this space, you cannot be curious enough. If you lack curiosity, develop it. Don't resist curiosity. You must be curious. You have to be passionate. And it doesn't hurt to like to doodle. We all doodle. The industrial designers use doodling as a second language. But it helps to have some level of, 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 of ability and lack of fear to doodle, to communicate your thoughts on paper with your hand. But more importantly, understand and embrace the importance of empathy, the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes, the ability to feel the pain points of the shareholder of whom you're serving. You see, another definition for industrial designers, and I need you to know this if you're interested in pursuing this career, is you are a consumer advocate. You advocate on behalf of consumers to make their lives better. And if you can't embrace that essential fundamental principle, then you probably you know, want to consider, continue to consider other careers because these are some of the deep-seated needs of industrial designers. And these are even needs that can aid any form of design, but specifically uh, the industrial designer, the designers of industry. And being a consumer advocate, the consumer is a component of that industry. I'm oh, another suggestion I want to make, I apologize, Atish. You should also consider advancing your career above and beyond just a bachelor's. It's a competitive field now, and I would advise you to place yourself on a track for master's. And as our sister, Dr. Leslie Ann Noll has done a doctor's. But think along the higher level uh, for your um, degree status, uh, if you really want to consider uh, doing some remarkable things in this field. Okay, hold up. There's a lot to unpack here. So mm -hmm. question number one. Um, I love the fact that you mentioned doodling because my parents still think I make money doodling anyway. So that's great. Um, <laughs> but this idea of doodling really resonates. I think what I like to do is I like to have a little notepad next to my bed and have a pen and not a pencil. Yes. So I can't erase my ideas. I have to have a pen because yes. it's permanence. Yes. And so if ever I wake up in a dream and have some sort of like inspiration or anxiety or whatever, I can go to my little thing, write stuff down. So I love the fact that you're talking about that. And I, th I encourage everyone to carry around a notepad or yep. even uh, write something in your notes and in, in, in your iPhone and stuff like that. So I love that. Um, but let's, let's talk a little bit about what if doing a master's or a doctorate or even a bachelor's is inaccessible for whatever reason, whether it's monetarily mm -hmm. or time or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what are the, are there any alternate routes that mm -hmm. uh, could be successful mm -hmm. future James Howard's like yep. could use? Talk to me a little yep. bit about that. Yeah. Yes. That alternate route is called entrepreneurship. First of all, it's, it's steadfastness, steadfastness. Do you realize, let's go back to Charlie's story. Charlie dropped out of college. He dropped out of college because he could not find a job to support his college work, okay? But he demonstrated the steadfastness and the belief in his ability to push through that barrier. So you have to be steadfast. And then if you're getting all the no's, like I constantly got in my career, then consider a track towards entrepreneurship. Get Stephen Burks or someone like Stephen Burks or even myself to serve as your mentor. Mentorship is so critical, all right? And so adopt a mentor in the same way Charlie Harrison was my mentor. Find your mentor. And don't be afraid to ask someone to serve as your mentor. 
Okay? Don't. Reach out to them. And, um, and so if you consider entrepreneurship, if you got an idea, you want to develop it, put it out there on your own. You don't have to be rich to put a product out there on the market. I have a procedure called the 30-minute entrepreneur. And if anyone is interested in me, send them a pamphlet again. Reach out to me through my email, and I will send you a pamphlet on the 30-minute entrepreneur. Okay? Once you finish it, you're ready. Once you finish my seven steps that I have in that pamphlet that explains what it takes to be an effective entrepreneur in this space today, you'll be pretty much convinced that entrepreneurship is for you. So, Ratish, I would say that entrepreneurship is one way. Steadfastness is another way. Um, and then, lastly, be willing pretty much to demonstrate in the same way Kennedy Thompson had to demonstrate and enter that award and won it for Motor Trans Magazine, put yourself in position to be held accountable. Go after the awards, go after the competitions. Sometimes all it takes is one. Next thing you know, it begins to gather legs and you're moving forward in your career pathway. Amazing. So let, let's talk about mentorship a little bit. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, first of all, are you open to being a mentor for any of the uh, individuals that are in the, where the black designers I, I am an open vessel. I make myself available to mentor at any time. Now listen, plain and simply, there aren't many opportunities. I will tell you unabashedly right now, there aren't many opportunities for you to spend time in a Zoom room with too many of the torch bearers that had to take the torch from the Charlie Harrisons of the world and the McKinley Thompsons of the world, right? And now I'm a torch bearer in that space, but now I'm more than willing to hand that torch over to you. But in order to do that, we have to have a conversation. And the basis of that conversation is mentorship, the byproduct of that conversation. Is mentorship. So please reach out to me. Reach out to me. Fantastic. Now that 30 minute entrepreneur thing, I think would be very empowering for our community of thousands of folks. Um, we will try to encourage folks to reach out to you. Now I don't want 3000 emails coming to you. So are you willing for us to distribute that PDF or what, however have you, or would you prefer them to come to you? Ritesh, I subscribe to one rule. I mean, many rules for success, but one of those rules that I subscribe to for success is to continually put yourself in a position to be held accountable, all right? So don't worry about the floods. If the floodgates must come, the floodgates must come. I'm well connected. I can easily parlay, uh, you know, in excess to other people that I'm connected to uh, from a uh, networking and mentor uh, stream. So I will let you uh, decide uh, the dis distribution of those queries, those inquiries. Okay, consider the floodgates open. We will <laughs> try to post in Black Caucus, some of the other relevant channels. I love it, love it, love it, love it. I know Crystal is eating that up in the chat right now. That's great. Now, let's talk about how a mentee, right, comes to you and says, hey, um, would you be a mentor for me? Uh, you said, let's have a conversation. Talk to me about that step. Talk to me about what would a potential mentee, ideal mentee-mentor relationship look like for you? Is it a regular chat with you? Is it you have some sort of structure for them, like a curriculum of sorts? What does that look like that's efficient for both the mentee and mentor and doesn't require any undue stress? I feel like I get this question all the time. Mentees mm -hmm. feel like they're a burden. Mentors feel like they should push their mentees more. You know, there's always that yeah. kind of lack of communication there. Talk yeah. to us a little bit about what that journey should look like for you. Sure. That journey should look like it needs to start with an understanding of the roles. In the design thinking world, we have essentially six different roles that you play from the maker to the inspirator to the facilitator, director, and so forth, the visionary. And the mentor mentee scenario, there are basically two roles. The role of the mentor 
has to begin with a commitment. It can't be superfluous. It has to be a commitment, a commitment to advocate for the good of that mentee that is coming to him for advice, for direction, sometimes for a job, other times for recommendation, letters of recommendation, right? Referrals, advice on interviewing techniques, okay? So these are all of the things that a mentor should have the capacity to offer, to offer. And so, uh, and then the mentee, the main requirement of a mentee, and please, everyone listen to this. You're not gonna hear this too often, but the main requirement of a mentee is to come with passion. Be passionate about something. You will be able to best utilize your mentor if you are passionate about something. You know why? Because that same passion is going to translate directly to your mentor, and he is going to do whatever he or she can to help advance you in your career pursuits. And I mean that. Try it. Demonstrate it. Bring me your most passionate pitch, and we'll work with it. Love it. Now, we have about 20 minutes or so left, and I mm -hmm. encourage you, uh, all the attendees, to continue sending over questions, whether it's private to the Where the Black Designers um, DMs in Zoom or publicly in the chat. Feel free to keep qu the questions coming because we still have plenty of time. Um, now, oh, man, there's so much, so much other stuff to talk about. Let's talk about sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. And what can industrial designers do, whether as an industry or as individuals to address climate change? Mm -hmm. That is an excellent question. And again, I refer you to Brother Stephen Burke because this is one of the missions that he has set upon himself to play in a space that simply has less of an impact on our carbon footprint. But there are other things that you can do. You can adopt a present model that the three factors of design has forced, there are three factors, you can adopt another factor, all right? The three factors are that forced design are society, technology, and art. And we are pretty much operated along that premise from day one, all throughout the history of design. But unfortunately, we have to now consider a fourth factor, and that is the environment, the environment. So as an industrial designer, take it upon yourself to be cognizant of what prospective employers bring to the carbon footprint. Take it upon yourself to be constantly challenging whether or not you can help design that product in such a way that it is not going to require, you know, so many ounces of plastic. It is not going to require an additional uh, impact on our carbon footprint. So yes, the responsibility. Now, many of us don't have the luxury of selecting and choosing and saying no to opportunities, right? So when you get in position to speak, one of the qualities of the industrial designer is the ability to speak and speak well. Present yourself. Express your concerns. Express your concerns. And I take you back to Charlie Harrison. This was a soft-spoken man but he demonstrated, even as he was working with all of those plastics, he always demonstrated a sensibility and concern for minimizing its use, for keeping it lightweight, for making something have two or three different functions so you wouldn't have to add an additional part. Demonstrating those levels of sensibility can begin to make a difference. They can begin to make a difference. Um, but yeah, and also I would suggest if you're genuinely concerned about that, call up Brother Stephen Burke and, and um, tell him you heard of uh, him on a lecture on the history of Black industrial designers and um, ask him for some advice. I'm sure he'd be uh, more than willing to provide it. Fantastic. Now, going along with these big, big hairy questions like climate change, et cetera, in general, what's your opinion on the biggest challenge within industrial design? And I'm curious your opinion on how you think we should address it and solve it. I think the biggest challenge to the career as a whole 
is increasing our presence in this space. More importantly, encouraging many of us in this space to transition from punching a clock nine to five to doing our own business, entrepreneurship. I would encourage any creative individual to be on the precipice of entrepreneurship. And I've got to explain something to you about that. Entrepreneurship does not necessarily mean you have to stop working elsewhere. As Onesimus demonstrated, as McKinley Thompson demonstrated, and as Charlie Harrison demonstrated, and all those after him have demonstrated, as a community, we are large. We have the capacity to be diverse and do a many of things. You're looking at one here. You had asked me for a, a, a tagline that I would refer to myself. I'm prompted now to remember that when I was teaching in college, my students referred to me as the Renaissance man, right? The point is be versatile, open yourselves up, have a growth mindset to do more than one thing. Work part-time, run your own business. Run your own business, work full-time teach. There are so many opportunities for the creative mind. And that's the only thing that's going to save this planet, a creative, big thinking mind. And that's the space that industrial designers play in on a daily basis. And that is the biggest challenge. Daring to think big. Daring to think big. I love this idea of having your cake and eating it too, right? I love this idea of having a nine to five, for the lack of a better term, where mm -hmm. you're getting paid, you're mm -hmm. able to put some food on the table and you live mm -hmm. somewhat comfortably. And then on the off hours, let's say you're five to nine in the evenings, for example, you're able to yeah. pursue some of your passions. Yeah. And for, I think that resonates probably really well for some of the younger folks who can't not afford, cannot afford to completely go to school and drop mm -hmm. what they're doing and, uh, and mm -hmm. the opportunity cost is so high. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me what you're talking about it, of this idea of if you create something and, and may, or, may or may not be patentable or you're just able to get some revenue from it, you just keep pursuing it. And then maybe mm -hmm. when the time is right, you can, you can turn your five to nine into the nine to five and then exit mm -hmm. gracefully. Um, I love that a lot. Um, now we talked a lot about, you know, the, the organization is called where the black designers we've talked mm -hmm. about who some of the black industrial designers are. We talked about when the black industrial designers through the history, let's talk about how, right? How are the black designers, mental health, physical health, spiritual health, et cetera. Can you talk to me a little bit about what advice you might have and some thoughts that go through your head? Um, for how to support those initiatives, which are seem like a growing, growing in visibility and growing in, in importance. Yeah, listen, brother, that is such an important question and I appreciate you asking it. Let's speak to that. Mental health and, um, and the quality of life. Industrial designers have a certain sensibility called intuition. They are required to take that intuition, to ask big questions and to challenge themselves. But that intuition also feeds you in hope. And in hope, there can be the adaptation of a positive posture. And so what I would say that comes out of the, how does one stay mentally fit in this space? adopting a positive posture. I teach at my school a lesson called perpetual optimism, right? Now, that is not my word usage. The first time I came across the word was through uh, a brother in our community by the name of uh, Colin Powell. And we all remember him, right? He served as the Secretary of Defense and uh, for Bush and um, just a remarkable man. He lectures on adopting perpetual optimism. And at the center of that is a healthy mindset that's going to remain positive because you have at your core, right, 
a belief that there's good in all men and women. There's good, there's good in humankind. And we can adopt that premise that there is good in all of humankind. You set yourself on a pathway for being positive, fulfilling good, emotionally, physically, and so forth. So perpetual optimism, tapping into your intuition. And again, that's just a natural byproduct of pretty much any designer. There's this intuitive quality that works above and beyond just the logic but also touches base here in the heart and in your gut. You can't demonstrate empathy without it, an absolute requirement. So I think just being an empathetic soul, being a soul that concerns for the good of mankind, helps to keep you on a positive, upbeat level. And if anyone is genuinely uh, struggling in that area at all, talk to someone. This is why mentors are so important. This is why instructors are so important. Speak to someone, adopt a friend, adopt a pet, but more than, you know, most importantly, don't just internalize it. Don't internalize it. Rebuild it. Talk to me a little bit about adopting a friend, because I think there's a few friends that I want to mm -hmm. adopt. What is, what is it? What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is a quality that other uh, that designers often practice in the design methodology process called tell a stranger. You see, it's the ability to feel confident and it starts with you actually connecting with your creative confidence. And when you have creative confidence, you can easily or more easily speak to a stranger. And it begins with you telling your story. Each and every one of you should know how to tell your story. And if you don't, I'm going to recommend you watch a specific episode, okay? And, uh, and Ritesh will be able to put it in the chat box because I'm going to speak it very, uh, very clearly. It is called Road Trip Nation, okay? That's the program, Road Trip Nation. But the specific episode, and this is what I want you to bite on, Ritesh, is why not us. You need to watch that episode. Why not us? It will have a lesson for every single collegiate student and post-collegiate student in the audience. It is a great episode on storytelling, connecting with your passions, demonstrating your creative confidence and mentorship. And by the way, that is where I came across the John Legend soundbite of no for now. And that is where I came across the Anna Marie Chavez soundbite of not letting anyone change your trajectory. Please watch that episode. It will help change a lot in your outlook on the importance of storytelling and the importance of connecting and reaching out. Fantastic. So yeah, chat, I threw that in to the chat. Um, so that's great. Thank you for mentioning that. It sounds mm -hmm. awesome. I'm definitely going to try to check that out tonight. Okay, we're coming up around five to seven minutes or so. Um, we've got a few more moments for questions, and then we'll kind of close it out. Um, one question I have is related to how can we support you? Um, are there any projects that you're working on um, that the community can potentially get involved with. It sounds like maybe Black Inventors Hall of Fames, maybe something different. I would love to like learn a little bit about that. Okay, uh, there are a few, there are a few ways, a few things. One, challenge me to have and find the time to give you one half hour of one-on-one -on -one interface, me listening to your passion, your needs, your concerns. So challenge me to be able to fit that into my already busy lifestyle, but meet that challenge, okay? That will help me. I am all about, continually about holding, putting myself in position to be held accountable. <clears throat> Two, specifically, if you're interested in helping us in our Black Inventors Hall of Fame, you can do a couple of things. As much as I have traveled the East Coast lecturing, on 
the history of design and the history of inventors and the history of this and history of that, I don't know a fraction of what's out there. I'm learning every day about a new African-American inventor, every single day. So please send me, say, hey, James, how come you don't have this person in your gallery, all right? First of all, I wanna encourage each one of you to go to the website, and that is www.bihof.org. B, B as in boy, ihof.org. And there's a section in there all the way at the end where you can contact us. Fill out that form. There's a section in there for nominating, nominating a black inventor for our inaugural um, presentation on our black inventors um, Hall of Fame next year. And it's going to actually occur on the same date as the Tulsa race massacre. Okay, so in May and June, we are planning to have our inaugural ceremony. I want to hear from you on who you would nominate as your favorite black uh, inventor. And by the way, it doesn't have to be old. It doesn't have to reach all the way back to slavery time or even reach back to Elijah McCoy time. If you know a prolific inventor now that needs to be brought to our attention, please bring this inventor, him or her, bring them to my attention and we were showcased and we will somehow manage to get that information. That's the whole purpose of why Black Inventors Hall of Fame was established to begin with. So we can uproot these untold stories. So that's another way you can help. And then thirdly, thirdly, and I mean this wholeheartedly, sincerely, if we happen to have a couple of product inventor types who, have, who are sitting on this idea, who, have, who just really wants to get past the fear of exposing that idea, please reach out to me. You will not contact anyone who is more deeply emphatic about helping you and directing you on how to take whatever you're thinking to the next step. And so I challenge you in that respect as well. You know, put yourself out there. Put yourself out there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think we should end it right there. Um, thank you so much for your incredible words, great teachings. I think there's so many actionable things to take away. There's some theory. There is so much to unpack. Um, I have posted James Howard's email address into the chat in case um, it's not accessible. It's jhoward8532 at gmail.com jhoward8532 at gmail.com. Seems like we have a few pieces of homework, right? There's always action items at the end of a meeting. Number one, contribute and support Black Inventors Hall of Fame. I link to that in the chat. And number two, if you are interested and able to set up a 30 minute, what are your passions? Let's chat with James Howard. Please email him. I will put a fake deadline but kind of real deadline to do that by the end of day today because it's so easy and hopefully you can chat more with james and we can increase the representation of black industrial designers thanks so much patish it's been a pleasure thank you and thank you everyone in the audience